Welcome to week four of the Styles Manufacturing Solutions series. I'm Andrew Swanson and I'm here with my colleague Christina Elsenbrook. Happy to be back here with you Andrew and happy to have you joining us for our kickoff to Surface Technologies Week. This week is all about the look and how Styles can help you stand out from your competition. Today's episode will focus on three primary surface applications, sanding, laminating, and finishing. Our surface team is ready to find scalable and reliable solutions for you. To help us explore these surface applications, we've invited sales engineer Brian Stiles to the studio. Brian, welcome today. Thanks for having me, Christina. Happy to be here today. The surface process starts with sanding. Can you tell us why a manufacturer would be motivated to move towards an automated process? Sure, as I'm talking with my customers, uh, I hear certain themes that come up again and again, and one of them is consistency with their results. They want a process that's repeatable, that's accurate, and that produces the same quality over and over again. The other one definitely is flexibility. They need to be able to move from one job to the next seamlessly. The other is labor. Labor is a huge topic right now and trying to reduce the amount of labor that goes into this process, utilize that skilled labor in other areas in the facility. So how can Styles help? Well, we definitely want to have a conversation with our customers. We want to get in and understand what their needs are and how we can help provide a solution to meet those needs. We know that Styles has a full range of products to help deliver a good solution. We also want to make sure that our customers are well trained. For that, we're going to utilize Styles University. So what's happening in the industry right now? What's trending, Brian? Yeah, we're excited about the Heisman Planetary Head. We want to show our customers what that can do for them. I think they're definitely going to be excited to see more on that. The other one is effect sanding. We can utilize existing technology in these machines to provide a vintage look, a textured look, even a rough sawn look. Let's go to one of our sanding experts, Peter Van Dyke, for more information. Sanding, as you know, is the first step of finishing and has a big impact on the quality of the product that you're uh, producing. And today, there's a lot of different tools in the toolbox that allow you to do a variety of different types of work, in some cases in one machine, in one pass. Um, we have a variety of solutions that are available. And to give you some kind of an idea of what uh, configurations are available, this is just a small uh, sample a little movie showing the different configurations but the reality of it is based on what a customer needs to do uh, we can put together a solution that will allow them to do things in either one pass or multiple passes depending on the production needed uh, to get the jobs done efficiently and consistently and as you can see uh, like I said this is a clever animation showing a variety of different machine configurations that uh, have been done for customers. You'll notice that the heads themselves are the same. It is really just the arrangement of those heads in the order of operations that uh, make each one of these unique. And this is only a small sample. Uh, there are certainly some standard configurations out there that uh, we see uh, over and over again. And we've uh, created a sanding program that addresses those. And here's an example of an overview of the two head sanding program at Styles. Uh, we start out with the Ironwood series and uh, 43 inch uh, solid wood type machines uh, and can go to a two head machine, 52 inch, 53 inch wide, uh, that can do everything from calibration, veneer and sealer. In addition to that, uh, we also have a more industrial lineup of machines for specifically for calibration uh, that are you know three head and four head type machines and those machines really are geared towards the solid wood industry whether it's kitchen cabinets solid wood processing companies whatever the case may be but really geared towards stock removal getting material flat and getting it to a dimension and a final finish Another series of machines that we uh, use a lot of times in conjunction with the solid wood machines are the brushing and orbital machines available. And these machines allow the customer to break the edges evenly. Uh, so when the material goes into finishing, we have a nice broken edge so that the coating flows around that nicely. Uh, we also have the ability to get rid of cross grain scratching uh, with the orbital heads, the OSR heads on the Heisman. 
And so if a customer is looking to have the material come out the back end with very little uh, hand work uh, that can be accomplished. And la last but not least, we also have a wide variety of finish sanding uh, machines that can uh, do everything from veneer to sealer to texturing to edge breaking and uh, and quite a few other things as well solid surface and even high gloss finishing can be done on these types of machines again the key here is really identifying what the market needs uh, and uh, we put a program together to meet those needs and anything that falls outside of um, a particular uh, customer's application, we of course can configure and make a machine specific for that. But these machines, these program machines, really account for probably about 80% of the market. And so we've been very successful by studying the market, understanding what uh, customers are looking for, and putting a program together to meet those needs. Now let's talk about something that is really revolutionary on the market, and that is the um, Heisman planetary head. The planetary head is quite revolutionary, and I'll show a video of just how this uh, planetary head works, but what makes it unique is it gives a very uniform, even scratch. It can be controlled um, via the controller. We have two different movements. The planetary head is very unique in the sense that it gives the customer the ability to use different types of uh, working units. It gives a, a, a great amount of control. Uh, we can control how fast the uh, planetary spins, how fast the individual disks spin. We can reverse those so that they can go in opposite directions. If they didn't do that and they were used, uh, Gearbox was used, and then you could actually have a kind of a stalling of the sanding pattern. So what it does is it produces a very uh, uniform scratch and we can modify that based on the applications. To give you some kind of an idea of what kind of um, uh, variety of disks that we can use, this picture uh, shows basically four common uh, tools that can be used in the planetary head. On the top left, you'll see a Anderlon uh, brush that is used for light texturing. Uh, that brush has um, abrasive grit impregnated into those nylon fibers. To the right of that is a wire brush for more aggressive texturing, kind of a, a rough textured look if that's desired can be achieved with that. And interestingly enough, even with the wire brush, we do not get uh, scratching that you might expect from something like that. You get a very even surface with a uh, nice textured look. And of course that can be controlled as far as how aggressive you'd like that to be based on how fast you're spinning it, what kind of uh, abrasive media that you need. And unlike drum brushes, what makes these disc brushes uh, unique is that one brush can give you a finished product. A lot of times with a drum brush, you need multiple uh, styles of brushes to get a, a unique finish. And in most cases, it'll be two to three type, two to three drum brushes to do that. With a disc brush, in a lot of cases, the finish will be a little bit different than a drum brush, but in most cases, customers really like the results and the fact that they only have to use one disc brush to get the job done. The lower left uh, uh, tool is a disc brush or a disc uh, unit, and that's used for uh, orbital sanding. It's used for randomizing for solid surface and even can be used for high gloss randomizing. Uh, so very flexible tool, scotch bright or regular abrasive paper can be used on a unit like that with different types of backings for different types of forgiveness levels uh, and cushions, so to speak. And the, probably the most common unit is the unit on the right, which is a uh, flex trim uh, type disc with abrasive uh, strips with brush uh, backing. And those uh, abrasive strips come in different grits. They come in different lengths, different uh, widths, and can be used anything from white wood sanding edge break to sealer sanding and uh, quite a quite a flexible unit that's probably the most popular use of the uh, planetary head the other thing with the planetary head that makes it unique because we have these different tools we have the ability to quick change 
uh, the tools. Now here you see a picture of a wire brush. Uh, you see a shaft. You see the uh, tool itself on the shaft. And then to the right of that is a, a quick connect pin that allows you to change these uh, abrasive discs uh, or brushes out very, very quickly. You can change out a set of uh, abrasive discs or brushes in less than five minutes. Let's look at some examples of some sanding that can be done with the uh, planetary head. Uh, the first one, again, probably the most common, is the five-piece door uh, edge break. Here you see an example of a door going into the machine. And we have the door open on the machine. Obviously, we don't recommend that. Uh, uh, this is just for video uh, purposes. But you will see the door uh, enter into the uh, uh, planetary area of the machine. Uh, the disks are swirling at a predetermined uh, rate uh, and RPM. And again, that can be controlled from the controller based on the aggressiveness that you're looking for. We also can control how deep we go into the material uh, what we call projection. So if we want le less edge break, we can go slower in terms of RPMs and we can raise the uh, brush units, uh, but we also can go deeper and faster and create more edge break. It just depends on the application. As you can see the door going through the machine. And there's a vacuum bed that holds those doors, uh, those parts in place, so we don't have to worry about them uh, moving around in the machine. And on the back side, the door comes out, all the edges are broken, and so they're ready for finish. So you have a nice, even edge break, so that if you want to seal sand, you could easily do that. Now let's look at another application, uh, and this has become very, very popular, is MDF's uh, brush sanding. Uh, so the amount of paint that customers are doing, uh, especially in the kitchen cabinet industry. Uh, and so uh, customers are routing out these panels themselves. Uh, in this particular case, we're showing a five piece shaker door uh, and also uh, an architectural panel um, that has a pattern on it. And both of these can be sanded with the planetary head, again, with that flex trim uh, brush um, discs uh, or brushes. And um, the idea behind to get that material smooth, uh, remove the router marks on that shaker panel, uh, remove any kind of fuzz or any kind of machining um, that um, needs to be smoothed out. Now, if the machining is very poor, um, there's a limit to what the brushes can do. However, uh, it's achievable to have the machine, the, the planetary head take care of the um, uh, surface of that product without having to touch it as long as the machining was done properly on the CNC's. And on the back side, you have um, uh, the five piece door with an edge break, the contoured surface evenly sanded and ready for finish. And again, because it was brush sanded, if this material uh, was coated with uh, um, paint or primer, uh, sealer, whatever the case may be, uh, then you could run that material back through the machine with different abrasives, typically more like a 320 or a 400 grit instead of the 180 or 220 grit we use in the whitewood um, for the seal sanding. So properly preparing that surface uh, with the uh, uh, planetary head allows us to do the sealer sanding downstream. So let's look at some primer sanding. Again, the same type of abrasives uh, on the planetary. Here you have a primer door. This primer door is a miter door with some uh, um, uh, bead work installed as well. So you can see a bit challenging, but the planetary does a very nice job of evenly scratching. And when we primer sand, we're really trying to reduce the fiber rays get that nice and smooth. And then the second thing that we're trying to accomplish is to create a scratch pattern, something for that uh, top coat to adhere to. And the planetary does a really nice job with three dimensional uh, surfaces. And here you see it go through the machine and it uh, uh, is um, uh, 
being evenly sanded with those brush strips. Again, 320, 400 grit. And on the back side, you have a nicely sanded product. In most cases, all the areas are covered. There could be some areas, depending on quality levels, that might need to be touched up a little bit. But generally speaking, can easily be done at the back side of the machine. So ready for the final finish. And you have a very consistent sand. Now the other um, application for the um, uh, planetary uh, is to use the wire brush uh, or an Anderlon brush for texturing. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Again, just using the planetary head, we're going to run a five piece door through the machine. And this really produces a nice look now really only works well on open grained woods like um, uh, oaks and hickory and ash, those types of woods. You wouldn't see much of an effect if you were running something like maple or cherry, etc. Uh, but really gives a nice vintage worn look to the surface. And again, even though we have grain going in different directions on this five piece door, we get a very even um, sanding and we do not get the swirl marks that you might expect a wire brush to do. It's very consistent and takes stain very well. Uh, and the look is uh, quite impressive. And here on the back side, you can see the door. A little hard to see in the video, but uh, there you can see the raised uh, grain, the harder grain, and then the soft grain um, sanded out. So very, very nice look. Now another application that that planetary can uh, do is solid surface um, uh, random orbiting. And so what that uh, allows us to do is we can prep the solid surface material um, with the use of uh, cross belts and wide belts to get up to about a 600 grit scratch. And then, of course, that by itself isn't good enough. If that was done by a wide belt or a cross belt, you would see lines from the belt. And we need to randomize that scratch. And so we use the discs. You can see them spinning quite rapidly. And there's a 600 grit uh, wide belt finish on this particular piece of solid surface. And when it gets to the planetary, uh, it will randomize that and basically give it a very uh, nice finish. And in some cases, especially if it's a muted uh, color like uh, a white or um, um, ivory, something like that, uh, in a lot of cases, you don't need to do any more work to it. But in the higher gloss uh, finishes and the solid, uh, the darker colors, you might have to do a buffing stage after. But in one pass through the machine, you can do a lot of that preliminary orbit sanding and provide a nice uh, surface finish with that planetary. So now let's talk about another interesting aspect of what's going on out there uh, with machine technology, and that is the ability to do some effect sanding. And effect sanding can mean quite a few different things. Here's kind of a collage of different parts that have been uh, sanded in different ways uh, with different uh, technology. And what you can see in this example is you see some samples where we have a resawn type look uh, that is done with a coarse uh, um, abrasive belt on a cross belt, 16 grit typically. And so we score across the grain to create that bandsaw line look. Then you also see uh, uh, some examples of where we have some uneven sanding on the surface. And we use uh, random firing segments on segmented pad uh, machines uh, to basically create kind of a hit or miss or vintage look, depending on what we're doing. And you see a couple different examples of that. And then the part that is on the, on the uh, lower, um, uh, or the bottom of that pile is a, a part that was brushed, um, textured, and then again also using the um, uh, segmented pads, the random firing of the segmented pads to kind of wear some areas away more than others. So it gives you kind of a real nice look. So let's take a look at a video that gives uh, you an example of how that looks uh, when we talk about um, random firing and of course uh, a coarse um, uh, 
cross grain scratches uh, on the surface. So here you see a panel going into the machine. You see the sensor rollers reading the uh, where the part is on the machine. And then after the machine knows where the part is, and because we have the ability to control the segments, in this particular case, we're gonna use a very coarse uh, cross belt, 16 grit, we'll sand across the grain to give the resawn type look from like a bandsaw. And you see that coarse grit. And on the back side, you'll see a panel that has been sanded to look like it was resawn with a bandsaw mill. Now what you're going to see is we're going to use that same technology with that coarse cross belt sanding across that, but now we're going to randomly hit that surface. And this in the industry kind of better known as kind of a hit or miss type look. So if let's say a board was sawn at a sawmill and it was planed, um, in a lot of cases you might get some areas that are smooth, some areas that uh, were missed. And so this produces a hit or miss type look um, for products that might be attractive to your customers. Now we're gonna look at a panel uh, and in this case, we're going to use the wide belt with the random firing of the segments, just like we did with the cross belt. But we're going to wear away some of the area of the primer and give this a uh, panel of vintage look. So again, very attractive uh, look. And can be done uh, on a machine. And the nice thing about this is that you can control what that look looks like and that can be programmed so it also can be repeated but yet at the same time still random now this is going to create what they call kind of a planar cut effect and uh, again just a little bit different look so there's different ways that you can manipulate the random firing of the segments and in this particular case there's a special pad you can see it below there and that pad is creating um, more intense sanding in smaller areas to create a, a different look than what the wider pad would do. And you'll see what the results of that are on the back side here. And it was also, didn't show it, but it was also um, a cross belt was used to, to create those saw marks. Now we can take that same kind of uh, technology that we talked about uh, with that type of pad and we can actually oscillate that as well so we can create kind of a wave pattern. So again, different types of um, effects can be done depending on what is put in the machine and uh, how it is programmed. So very interesting stuff and uh, of course um, for certain types of uh, customers uh, these this flexibility is very um, appealing, gives them the ability to offer a lot of different things uh, to their customers. And um, of course, uh, you know, what is considered in style uh, changes and this gives them the ability of the customer, the ability to uh, keep up with uh, different styles that are uh, available or out there and customers are interested in buying. Now the second or the last thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, Styles University. And we had just a couple of weeks ago completed a sanding class that uh, myself and Ken Van Wick had um, uh, completed for a week with our field service representatives. And basically this is a new group of field service guys that will be working on sanders. And what we uh, invested in was um, a week long training session that allowed them to learn how to properly set up the machines. So there was a better part of two days, you know, leveling, adjusting, making sure that the machines are basically working properly. And uh, this was hands on. We were doing this at the machine and uh, Ken, a seasoned veteran, you know, took this group through the right way to set the machines up so that we, you know, get off on the right foot with the customer. 
And then the, uh, the second part of uh, the sanding training was application. And I taught that along with Ken and really, you know, showing these guys how we can um, use the sanders with um, education on abrasive belts, on um, machine parameters and setups uh, so that you, they knew what kind of settings to use with different types of materials. You know, whether it's veneer, solid wood, um, sealer, uh, et cetera, and all the different types of sanding heads. We did this in our High Point, North Carolina facility. And so uh, about uh, a third, well, basically about 50% of the time was in classroom with theory. And the other 50% was on the machines itself, uh, learning uh, what to do with the machines, how to set them up, et cetera. We do this not only with our people internally, but Styles University has a full range of classes, not only sanding classes, but whether it is application training on various machines or maintenance, or in this particular case, it was a combination. Um, so it's another uh, benefit of partnering up with Styles and uh, getting your people properly trained and so if there's interest in that, by all means, reach out to us and we certainly can help you with that. Other than that, thank you and I hope you enjoyed today's session. Let's take a look at another type of surface processing and that's laminating. Brian, can you tell us what Styles has to offer in that category? Absolutely. Styles is happy to partner with a couple great manufacturers, Orma and Wemhoner. So let's take a closer look at that. So we just saw a quick video showing us some of our products and I'm going to introduce you to Ken McFadden who's our senior product manager. Ken, thanks for being with us here today. Um, Ken, explain a little bit about what Styles has in this category. Sure, thanks Brian. In regards to laminating, we kind of divide it up into flat pressing and then what I call 3D or membrane pressing. So flat pressing would be uh, flat pressing HPL or veneer. Um, and this is typically done with either an Orma press or Wemhoner press, so we kind of have different solutions, Orma being the entry level, Wemhoner being more of the automated through feed type press. Um, and then we get into also uh, TFL for uh, like melamine is what they've called this before for furniture as well as laminate flooring. Uh, but I do want to primarily focus on the 3D laminating because this is where we're seeing the most activity. Yeah, and this product's been around uh, certainly quite a, quite a long time, um, but we are seeing it change a bit. Uh, tell me a little bit where, where we're seeing this product. Sure, so primarily started out back in the 80s for kitchen cabinet uh, doors and drawer fronts, uh, available in very limited colors, whites, grays, almonds, um, has uh, uh, formed into really basically some really awesome looking stuff with the wood grain uh, material embossed and register high gloss so that the print quality 
has really come a long ways in regards to all of that. Um, so kitchen cabinets, kind of where it started, that's still a, a better part of what this is used for, as well as retail and store fixtures, office furniture tops, as well as institutional furniture such as schools. Yeah, and certainly as I'm out talking to customers, I'm seeing this show up in some other uh, industries as well. Uh, closets is a big one. Um, but certainly now with, um, with the medical industry, they're embracing this big time. I know RV industry is, is super popular right now. Um, but why is this product kind of unique over what we would see as a more traditionally produced product? Okay, so as I mentioned also in regards to uh, the print quality, right, it, and the aesthetics uh, of it, it, it provides smooth surfaces, uh, seamless edges. So, you know, you have a typical uh, HPL top with uh, edge banding. Uh, we've now gotten rid of that seam, right? Because we have the top and the sides as all one material applied all at the same time. So softer edges, radius edges, it's easier to clean, easier to maintain, and you can use it for many different applications out there. Great, and I know that uh, once we get into talking to customers that are trying to produce at a little bit higher level, uh, the automation and the material handling automation is key with this stuff. So how does Wemhoner handle some of that stuff? Sure. So I have a video I'd like to play to show everybody uh, in regards to that automated solution that you just mentioned. As you'll see in the video, we have an automatic glue spray system. And this spray system actually then sprays the adhesive onto each individual part and we keep this part as a charge and we collect this charge and load onto the press tray automatically. You will see in the video that the parts get uh, laid onto the tray itself and then the operator will provide a finished or final alignment of the parts if you will uh, taking into account the spacing in between each part and the wood grain orientation if there is any on the vinyl film. This tray then is lowered automatically sent underneath the press through Wemhoner's automatic patented vario pin system where we set the pins for each individual part so that we raise the parts onto the tray. The tray then comes to the next position where we actually load the vinyl film sheet onto the tray itself. So this is typically a roll material where we pull from a roll and then we cut the material to length so that is in sheet form and laid onto the tray with no operator involvement at all. This tray then is transported into the press and then what we are showing uh, in regards to the actual press itself is we have a cutout showing the membrane and the vinyl film and then the part itself and you can see how all of these materials relate to each other. The pins raise the part once inside the press then the pressing process starts or the cycle after the cycle is complete, the finished tray of parts come out of the press and then it is picked up with using an automatic turnover device that picks the parts up off the tray for trimming and then the empty tray can then go back to the reload position so we do not tie up the press with doing the trimming of the parts themselves. In this video we actually show the, the carpet or finished charge of parts being transported into an automatic trimming machine and then to a buffing machine that removes some residual glue over spray on the back sides of the parts. Thanks, Ken. And we're back in studio with Brian Stiles. Brian, we've talked about sanding, we've talked about laminating, but what about finishing? Yeah, like a lot of these other topics, adding automation in the finishing process can really be a benefit for our customers. It gives them consistency that they just can't get with hand spraying. It also has a big time benefit. It may take a couple days to spray an entire kitchen. We can do that on an automated flat line spray machine in potentially a couple hours. The other is material savings. With the technology in these machines, we're confident a customer can save 25% or more in coating costs. That's impressive. But is automation only for large manufacturers then? Absolutely not. We've got great solutions to fit any size company. We've put spray machines into companies with as few as three people. The key is to really identify what the customer's needs are and provide the right solution. Are ovens required? Not necessarily. If the automation improves the spraying process, 
and the bottleneck becomes curing and drying, we can always add an oven. Thanks, Brian. Let's go to finishing specialist Doug Mounts for more on flatline spraying. So let's look uh, a little deeper into flatline spraying and what are some of the, the causes for problems with hand spraying. First of all, I want to talk about transfer efficiency. Transfer efficiency is the amount of material that's reaching the part. As you're spraying, uh, let's say you are you have a 50% transfer efficiency. That means 50% of the, the material that you're spraying is reaching the part. The other 50% is waste or overspray. Spray angle can affect uh, your transfer efficiency if you don't have the right spray angle. The distance from the part. The stroke speed and the overlap play a big part in what the transfer efficiency of spraying by hand or with automation. So if you look at this illustration, uh, you'll see we have a, a gun that's kind of angled downwards. The top of that spray pattern, which comes out in a V shape, is going to, you're going to apply a thicker coat than what you would at the bottom side. Uh, this illustration shows if the gun is too close, the upper, upper left, it's uh, it's going to apply too much and your spray pattern is going to be narrow. The the one at the bottom shows you if your gun is too far away. Being too far away will cause a dry spray or dusting, which is obviously not what you want. The illustration on the right, the gun in the center shows correct orientation of how that gun should should be oriented to the part you're spraying. You need to maintain that same orientation all the way to the right and all the way to the left. If you don't, you're going to be drier on each end than you are in the middle. As far as overlap and stroke speed, you need to have a consistent speed across the part as you're spraying. If you go too fast, it's going to apply too little. If you go too slow, it's going to be too heavy. And as far as overlap, you need to overlap. Each pass you make needs to overlap 50%. So as you drop your gun down, you need to, to respray 50% of what you just sprayed to make sure that there's no lines in between. You want the uniform application on each pass you make across that part. Here's me spraying in, in actual time in, the, in, the, in our lab. Um, and you can see what that looks like, what we just talked about. If you'll notice, I've got my gun angled too far forward, and we're going to be heavy on one side and dry on the other side. Uh, the opposite of that, the gun's angled too far back. We're going to be heavy on the bottom, and we'll be thin on top. Here, the gun is too close and uh, too far away. Keep in mind, this is the same stain. It's just looking different. There, I made a fast stroke. Here, a slower stroke. Tremendous amount of difference. Now, I want to look at overspray. I want to show you what is not correct overlap. So there's a lot of things your sprayer needs to be thinking about when they're spraying. They've got to keep all these things in mind. The reason I used stain was just to, it was, it shows up more uh, how different, uh, just a few slight changes could make. If you were spraying white paint or clear or sealer, you'll still have that same inconsistency if you don't maintain correct orientation of your gun. So why flatline spraying? One of the main reasons is consistency. So let's look at how we can achieve a more consistent finish. See that arm traveling back and forth. It's the same speed constantly. It's the same uh, distance from the part. Those guns are fixed. They don't change. So it's going to be spray exactly the same on part after part. Now, when we, to, to handle the overlap, we know we have a constant line speed and we know the ratio between line speed and the reciprocation uh how many recips per minute let's say if we're running 10 feet a minute then we will we will want 30 oscillations per minute 
depending on what your line speed is, there's a correlation with the stroke speed. We know how to set that up when we install your machine, so you don't have to worry about that. You just load your parts. Here we're loading a few parts. Um, this is in our lab. In, in normal production, you, you would want to load across the width of the belt to utilize uh, the whole width of that belt, a 51 inch working width. Notice we're spraying same distance, same gun angle, the same speed. And that's going to give you a consistent, uniform application of your coating with the correct millage all the way across that part. So what goes along with the transfer efficiency is if you are wasting material, then there's a cost associated with that. So manual spraying, uh, studies have shown over the years at, at best, you're going to get about a 30% transfer efficiency rating. So 30% of that gallon that you're uh, that you bought, only 30% of that's going on your part. You're losing 70%. I, I know it sounds like a lot, but those filters and the floor, and that's why the finishing room is usually pretty dirty, is that overspray, that's just wasted material. When we look at flatline spraying, because of the things we just looked at, that how we can uniformly apply the material, we can achieve a 60% transfer efficiency. So there's a 30% savings in your in the material that you're buying, uh, which is money. That's your first opportunity to see a, a return on your investment is in the coatings that you're going to save. Uh, but definitely, that's not the biggest return on investment. Labor savings is a huge uh, return. So we know a standard kitchen is approximately 300 parts. So we're, we're saying uh, one day equals eight hours and a labor rate of, of $25 an hour. Maybe a little high, could be a little low, depending on your area. Manual spraying, uh, just from uh, throughout the years, we know it takes three people, typically three days, to finish those 300 parts, to, to finish that kitchen. And that's going to be a, a labor rate of about $1,800 to do that job or that project. Now, when we look at using those same three employees, same labor rate, we can do that same job in four hours, a half a day. Now that project is costing you $300 in labor. So you're saving $1,500 for that kitchen. That's huge. That's your biggest opportunity to, to, to pay back on that machine. One other thing I want you to think about and look at that from three days to a half a day. Now you've freed up two and a half days to utilize that personnel somewhere else. Or if you can uh, give the, the finishing department or the, the spray machine more material to spray, the more you can, can feed that machine, obviously the, the quicker you're going to be able to pay that machine off. Now we've looked at how uh, flatline spraying using a reciprocating spray machine is important and gives you all the things that we've talked about. Here is a five axis spray machine. And what it does, you've got one gun that's going to only focus on the edges or the interior pro, uh, profile sections of your door or whatever you're spraying. So, but we're doing the same thing. We're keeping that same distance, same stroke speed, same angle. That you, that's why that the gun has to turn and orient correctly. Then we are in the recip. Uh, the five axis uh, gives you a more even more precise way of applying your coating, still maintaining that superior uh, transfer efficiency. If you'll notice, uh, this particular machine is is being run in a uh, continuous mode. So you've got a set of guns that's concentrating on your, your profile, your edges. Your second set is, would be like the standard recip we just looked at that's concentrating mainly on the flats. Uh, this solution is good for thicker parts and it's great for glue application. So we've talked a little bit about flatline spraying. Uh, we want to look at a <clears throat> new process that uh, 
uh, MACOR has come out with, Gesso, UV Gesso. Gesso has been around a long time, typically in a water-based situation. Uh, the goal is to fill defects in your in your parts, in your wood, to utilize uh, non-select wood. Uh, obviously, it's cheaper if you can, can buy parts with uh, knot holes or especially finger jointed material, we can fill that, uh, let's say we can fill poplar, finger jointed poplar and make it look like a solid piece of maple once uh, we put a, the coating over top of this. So we're loading this machine and it's being uh, forced through a template, rubber templates. Uh, there's We've got quite a bit of pressure that we're uh, feeding these parts through. And as you'll see in a second, where we have uh, an application head that has rubber templates on the entrance and the exit of this machine. What that's doing is, is applying the coating, scraping everything off, only leaving what the wood wants to take. And if you have a void there, a uh, finger joint, uh, a, a hole, a, pine, a knot, then that UV material will fill that void, that defect. Since it's 100% solid, we can immediately cure it. And as you can see, in just a matter of three or four seconds, and that, that product is finished, it's complete. It's ready to go and now apply your primer or your, your paint, whatever paint color that you want to apply on there. But in a second here, I'll show you how we've uh, able to feel what may have been, a, what was a defect and what would require someone to manually putty uh, or in certain, in a lot of cases, that defect would have to be cut out. So notice we've got a couple knot holes here. And if you look down, you can see a whitish material. That's that UV gesso. We just filled that hole automatically. There's another one that, that we've we've completely filled that that defect and now it, it's considered no longer a defect. So we can take that material over to the sander and then we'll see here we're going to spray a, a white primer on top and it's going to give us a nice uniform look that simulates a, a number one select piece of wood which you know, with those knots, you know, it, it probably was a number three or whatever that grading system is. We can take uh, inferior wood, apply this UV gesso to it, and turn it into a superior product. Obviously, the the cost of uh, the substrate plays a big a big part. Then we'll go through the normal process of drying it. Here we're going, coming through a cross transfer oven and then exiting on out. You know, we showed the UV gesso process and then we showed the profile spray machine spraying that part. Here's a, a video I really like that shows how precise we can fire the guns off and on. Uh, this this particular uh, machine was was running at 125 feet a minute. We've got it slowed down, but we're running a piece of molding through here. Uh, and you can see we're turning the gun on and turning it off almost exactly on the part. So it's slowed down. We turned the guns on just right prior to it hitting the spray pattern. Continue that until we reach the, the end of that uh, piece of molding and then turn those guns off. We have a, a reading bar at the front that is going that reads the part and tells the guns when to fire off and on so with that kind of setup our transfer efficiency is really really up there and which will help you save in coatings here's an example uh and i've kind of jumped around a little bit you may have seen some of these videos before i you know i wanted to show them to you again just to kind of reiterate how we can compete against the manual sprayer and why automating your finishing line is is so important. Um, but uh, we looked at profiles a little bit, five axis. This is a, a fully 
a complete robot system where we're spraying glue. And this will tie into our, our latest uh, next section coming up. Uh, we're cleaning the parts automatically. A reading bar or a sensor reads the parts, tells the gun, tells the robot where he needs to spray. In glue, it's extremely important to get adequate edge coverage. Uh, since those are typically routed or cutted, cut they have they will be a little more rough than the flat surface, so we need an additional amount of glue. So this robotic arm allows us to concentrate, spe you know, specifically for the edges, and then it automatically continues down and goes under a resip to get those edges again, as well as the flat uh, surface. Here we show how we're pressurizing air from the top, pushing it down, exhausting it out, keeping that chamber clean. This is a great feature uh, where the overspray that hits the belt, the glue overspray, we dry that. And once it's dry, we can take and, and scrape those off using erasers to clean that belt. So each revolution is a clean belt. After we go through those brushes, We'll go through water and clean that belt one last time to remove dust. Most parts will continue on down, automatically going into the oven. Depending on which glue you're using will depend on dwell time. Here we're here it's set up going feeding two membrane presses. We'll talk about that in a uh, in a couple of minutes. In some cases, with if even if you have a resip spray machine applying glue, you will still need to stack your parts up, spray that by hand, unload those onto a spray machine. Here you eliminate as much as, as handling as possible. You lay the parts on there, the edges get sprayed, the flats get sprayed, the glue gets dried and then sent to the, to the pressing. So I hope you, you enjoyed what we looked at with the, uh, the efficiency, the uniformity of application, the labor savings, the coating savings, the quality of finish that you can be achieved with uh, Flatline. We've covered sanding, laminating, and spraying. Now let's put it all together. There's various reasons that scalable solutions um, exist today. And we've got a, a team here that is gonna address uh, some of those things. and. You know, one of the things, you know, why have scalable solutions for smaller shops come into existence? From my perspective, if we're looking at a, a smaller company starting out, the goal, I would assume for any custom co company would be to want to, to grow. And with what we're going to be talking about today, this gives you the opportunity just to start somewhat entry level in a small type setup and add to your spray machine let's say if that's if that's what we're starting with and and grow with that as long as the machine is placed in an area that will allow machines to be added to it so the goal is to grow the cust the customer to grow yeah and i think doug um you know it, the different uh offerings uh that we have here at styles for our various products allows the customer to grow at their own pace so we can start off with an entry-level machine for a smaller shop with the goal to be possibly uh, that customer ends up to be a mid shop not, not every not every customer wants to be a high production high automated facility so therefore we have many different solutions um, depending on what that that customer's ultimate goal is and, and their own comfort level as well yeah, and Ken, that's that's a good point. And you know, over the course of time, technology has really um, become affordable uh, you know, for a small shop. And in the in the old days, you know, it was the large you know shops that could um, implement this kind of technology. But the the scale uh, on the small level just did not allow um, the investment uh, to um, to do certain types of operations and and grow like they can today. Correct. And that brings up a good point. Uh, you know, Doug, you mentioned it regarding um, being able to do things in phases. You know, um, 
a line, you know, looking at the end game, looking at Nirvana, as I like to say. Um, it's important to look at that, but, you know, we do see a lot of customers that want to start out with one aspect of that, you know, uh, on a finish line, it could be a, it could be a, a spray machine, it, it could be an oven, it could be a sander, um, you know, and the same is true on the lamination side. Um, what are your thoughts, guys, regarding that? Well, the spray machine pretty much dictates the uniformity of spray, uh, the, the increased production. So that is the starting point, in my opinion. Uh, when drying may be, become your bottleneck, then ovens could be added. Uh, say if sanding, once you're able to produce you know, quality product through the spray machine, then sanding is going to be come into play. Okay, we need to improve our sanding to keep up with the spray machine. We need to improve our ovens to keep up with the spray machine. So <clears throat> it's all like it was. You know, we're, we're talking about it. It is scalable. Start at one area and fix that, and then move on to the next. With whether it's sanding or ovens. And, and I and I agree, Doug. I, I think our responsibility is just to make sure that we steer the customer in the right direction. Um, we don't want to provide a uh, semi-automated solution that can't be automated later on, and it might require um, a different model to start with, uh, so that we can add to it. Um, and again, it's it's. Uh, not uncommon for customers to consider doing projects in phases, um, but it's just we have to be able to ask these types of questions um, on these products to uh, to get to that uh, to get to you know understand what the customer is really thinking. Yeah, you bring up a really good point there, Ken, and that is, you know, it's our job really to um, educate ourselves on what the customer's needs are, short term, long term and then educate the customer on what technology is available. And quite frankly, put them in a position so they can make a good decision for their for their company, not only short term, but long term. Let's, let's look at some examples, guys. Um, let's uh, first look at um, a membrane uh, press line um, and uh, what that could look like. And uh, what we see on the, the screen here is a complete line uh, that could be done in phases. Uh, but this is what the end game could look like. And of course, as a customer uh, grows, their production demands increase, they can add to the line to meet those needs. And uh, I'll start out on the beginning of the line. Uh, the blue uh, area is a, is a brush sander, and that brush sander could take care of the MDF product, uh, three-dimensional product that is eventually gonna get membrane pressed. Um, and uh, prep that, get the dust off the material uh, so that it's ready for glue application. Uh, Doug, why don't you talk a little bit about the glue application? Yeah, once it leaves the sander, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it's going to be it's going to be clean, so we're ready to spray the glue. And it, you know, it's important to remember when spraying glue, the edge coverage has got to be uh, very good. Uh, here we're looking at a, a an evolution five axis uh, robotic type spray so we get good edge coverage as well as coverage on the flats once it leaves there it's going to transition automatically into the drying ovens which will prepare it for the the pressing operation and Ken if you would take it from there yeah and then, and then from there and basically what we're doing from the from the oven standpoint is just, uh, flashing off the, the moisture in the glue. So it is a water-based adhesive that's used for uh, 3D pressing. Um, and so we are just removing the moisture. Um, after it exits the, uh, the belt conveyor from the drying oven, we will automatically load uh, these parts onto the tray as a charge. And from there, there's there's an operator shown there just to kind of do a, a final alignment so that the parts are uh, straight on the tray relative to let's say any kind of grain direction that you would have with the uh, with the, the 3D material or the vinyl. Um, from there, 
the uh, the process continues uh, in an automated fashion. Um, the tray gets scanned. The film gets unwound and cut onto the tray, and then it goes into the press. And then after the press, the parts are unloaded uh, with an automatic turnover device. And then that completes that cycle for that charge of parts. In the meantime, you have accumulated uh, other charges. There are typically three trays uh, on a press of this size. So we are, we are showing the Wemhoner uh, Professional 3000 series. And again, going back to our discussion, we're, we're back to the scalable solutions discussion. We're just trying to show um, similar machinery uh, throughout the process so that the press matches the sander for the prepping and match, matches the spray machine. So, um, and again, we could we could have, we could scale this down or with the end game in mind that the customer ultimately wants to end up with the shop looking something like this. Yeah, that's a very good point. And down below, you can see that uh, eventually it could end up that we'd have uh, four operators and a, and a supervisor, you know, taking care of that line. Um, mm -hmm. It would take up about 7,800 square feet floor space, but have the ability to do about 200 parts per hour, which uh, is quite a bit an output, quite a bit of output for uh, a line such as this. Let's look at another example. Let's look at a finish line um, scalable solution. And again, we'll start out with a sander uh, that's in blue. In this particular case, it's a Heisman sander that um, um, can have various components in based on what the customer needs to do, whether it's you know calibration, solid wood, veneer, um, uh, et cetera, uh, sealer, brush sanding. Uh, all of those things can be put in the sander to meet the needs to prep the material. Uh, prior to going into the spray machine, which is in green, uh, which um, Doug can talk a little bit about. Yeah, once we leave the the sander again, it, you know we're we're presenting clean parts uh, to be finished. Uh, well, this particular machine would is a re reciprocating spray machine, does great on profiled parts, uh, raised panel doors. Uh, this particular machine is a paper belt, which, you know, we were talking before, we could start with just that spray machine and, and add these other machines uh, to it. Once we leave the spray machine, we would go into a multi-level oven. So our, our parts would be traveling down the line in charges. Uh, that, that oven is a six level. Should, at 10 feet a minute, we should get approximately 12 minutes of dwell time in there to low, uh, a low temperature, low volume of air to, to start to remove some of that solvent or water out. And there it'll automatically travel into the, the high velocity oven and then exit out. Uh, this can be a, a stain sealer top coat uh, situation. It could be two primers in a, a white top coat, let's say a color top coat. Uh, typically, when uh, if we're running at 10 feet a minute on this line, we could conceivably produce uh, around 60 finished parts per hour, uh, which is you know we've eliminated uh, some of the, the the issues of well we're going to unload the spray machine and let it sit on racks. Here we've got the ovens to take to take, that, take care of that. We've added a sander to help eliminate the hand sanding. And I know, uh, you know, this the sanders will do a majority of a raised panel door. So this could, this sits, this setup is very versatile and could handle a multitude of, of finishes. And again, you see three operators producing a lot of uh, material, a lot of finished goods in about 3,700 square feet of uh, floor, space, floor space. And essentially we're talking about 70 parts uh, a minute if we're talking about stain, sealer, and top coat, correct, Doug? 70 parts an hour. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, my mistake, 70 yeah, parts an hour. that's fine. And that would be uh, finishing both sides, so it would be a six-pass type operation. 
So really, guys, the you know wrapping up here, the um, equipment has become you know very uh, scalable. But the important factor, uh, I think we all agree, is that uh, we look at what the lines or the needs of the cust customer could potentially be so that we help them make good decisions along the way, especially if this is going to be um, uh, a line that will grow with components uh, over time. And then the other aspect that we didn't touch a lot on initially, but you know, really understanding you know, ROI. And ROI is, is different for all people. You know, there's certainly the financial side of ROI where uh, you have a payback on, on the equipment. But we've uh, seen some cases, uh, Doug, uh, why don't you touch base on there's a customer uh, that uh, their ROI was that he could, uh, he was one of the owners and, and he could go duck hunting. Yeah, uh, you know, as we all know, uh, it's more and more difficult to, to have to find quality workers, unfortunately, but uh, this particular customer, they uh, they would have employees, but the employees wouldn't show up, so they would have to go out and do the spraying themselves, uh, trying to run the company, and then doing the finishing. And uh, you know, they they felt it was an easily justified purchase to to go with a spray machine. And really, the main goal was to uh, allow himself to go duck hunting. That was that's how he uh, relaxed and got away from it all and and obviously there was a return on the ROI for financial reasons but for him it was uh, freeing up some time yeah 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 very good very good point an interesting uh, nice story uh, Ken anything to add on uh, ROI and anything that you've seen over the years that might be interesting no I, th I think it's important to note that um, each customer has their own uh, viewpoint on ROI is uh, the duck hunting thing was kind of new to me, but uh, I like it. Um, the uh, it, it basically every customer I think kind of has their own hot button, if you will, um, in regards to bottlenecks in their operation, and uh, you know we kind of need to have that discussion with our customers um, to understand. Uh, what it is today that they're having problems with and what what needs to be solved to get the right solution. One of the other things that just kind of a thought to, to leave everybody with regarding uh, ROI is opportunities. And, um, you know, one of the questions I'll ask a customer is, you know, what kind of opportunities are you being asked uh, to do? Um, but uh, it's either difficult for you to do, maybe you can't do it, you don't have the right equipment, the right people, whatever the case may be. But um, maybe there's uh, maybe there's real opportunity there, and sometimes those things can have a dramatic impact on a, on a customer's business. Peter, Ken, and Doug have shown us that all of this is possible. So how do we get started, Brian? Well, we want to have conversations with our customers. We know we have great products. We have great experts to help. We know that some customers already have that roadmap figured out, and we'll work with them to help execute on that. But we also know that the scalability of these solutions can happen over years. And so we'd love to consult with our customers, figure out a way to help lay out that five, 10, 15 year roadmap and execute on that. Brian, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Remember, Andrew, it's all about the look. You're right. And our Surface team just outlined how that look can be achieved easily and at your own pace. Thank you for joining us today. Your feedback is very important to us, so please complete the survey at the end of this episode that will appear on your screen. If you have questions for today's presenters or would like more information on our live events or virtual demonstrations taking place throughout the week, please visit stylesmss.com. We hope you join us again next Monday as we conclude our Manufacturing Solutions series. Next week, our focus is on solid wood, and we hope to see you then. Take care. <laughs>